I've never had a time in my professional life where Americans have been more concerned about their own self-protection. We have 11 million new gun owners this year. And I thought it would be really relevant for us to look at how would you most likely use that tool if you truly were using it for self-protection? What are the things you have to consider? How would you train correctly for that? That's something that most people probably don't even look at. I'm so shocked at how many people do firearms training. I'm sorry, buy firearms and get no training whatsoever. Um, today's interview is with a true subject matter expert, Bill Rapier, former longtime member of uh, DevGrew, formerly known as SEAL Team 6, a Tier 1 unit within the military, within the Navy, uh, Naval Special Warfare community. Bill was uh, an operator for a long time, training, became a true subject matter expert when it comes to firearms, and uh, he now has a company called Amtac. He has Amtac Security, I'm sorry, Amtac Training, and Amtac Blades, where he actually makes uh, combat blades that he trains with. And Bill has a very straightforward way of Talking about the subject, I was really, really happy. One of the cool things about being in this industry and having as many friends as I do is you get introduced to really cool people. And I've heard Bill of Bill for years, and um, I'm hoping to set up training with him later in the year that I will invite you folks to. Um, but I wanted you to hear from him first because he's just an outstanding individual. Uh, the first part of this interview, we go into his background, his SEAL team background, how he got in there, what was like the training he has a unique background growing up as a Christian missionary family, um, how that affected him and helped him in his training later on. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this first part of my interview with Bill Rapier of Amtech Security. Amtech Security. Bill, thanks so much for uh, doing the interview. Uh, it's, it's awesome to have you. I've been, um, I have a lot of people that I know that know you and um, you know, I, I've talked to you once before, but uh, it's really been great to see what you've developed with Amtac uh, in just a few short years you've been doing it. Um, I, I think it would be really helpful for my folks to get a background on you. Um, can you kind of tell them, you know, growing up and everything was the military always something for you. Then when you got in, how did you decide SEAL teams? And then your career within the teams, I think is, is really interesting. Okay, well, so we'll start off with a, a very short, a, a brief thing. Um, no, I'm here. First off, Tim, thanks for having me on. Uh, great, great to be on your show. Uh, okay, so I background, a brief background about myself. Uh, I was a missionary kid, so we moved to Germany uh, when I was five years old. I got thrown into a German kindergarten, not speaking a lick of German uh, at, at the age of five. Maybe I was six if I, by the time I got in there. I don't remember exactly. But uh, uh, so very quickly, obviously, learned how to speak German. Uh, so that was a lot of my formative years were in Germany. We left Germany in the at the completion of the sixth grade. And then we moved to SoCal for about six months or so. That was the first time I went to an English speaking school, uh, which was kind of cool. I, I had definitely. Uh, I had missed uh you know going being in a, in a in an american environment and it was definitely something that i was uh it was was longing for and so i got to do a very brief you know six months yeah. uh first half of seventh grade i got to do in, in los gatos california and then uh then we moved to swaziland in in southern africa uh, we lived there for about two years, really loved it there. Uh, you know, Southern Africa is a, a magical place. It's, it's uh, very, very cool. Uh, so we were there for about two years and then moved to Colorado. And I finished up the last three years of high school in Colorado Springs. Uh, since about as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be in the military. Uh, and so when I first, you know, kind of verbalized that to my dad he would said well if you want to join the military you should go to one of the service academies and you, know, you should go to West Point so uh, for a long time that was uh, 
that was my goal was to go to West Point. And I was kind of on that track until about, uh, about my junior year in high school. And I started wrestling and, you know, they, they don't have the same type of organized school sports overseas as they do stateside. And I, I mean, just kind of an interesting aside, I think it's, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why we have better soldiers than just about anyone else is because our, our boys and our, you know, young men start at an early age with, with organized, you know, physical, you know, physically challenging and mentally challenging um, sports. So uh, about my junior year, I started playing, I started wrestling and then I uh, kind of fell off the path a little bit as far as academics go and kind of got into a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of partying and my, my grades just went, went down the tubes. And so by the time I was partway through my senior year, I had no desire to go and uh, study for another four years. Right. So uh, I just started looking at, well, what, what looks like the hardest organization to get into with the highest likelihood of seeing action. And that was really how I, how I looked at it. I looked at, you know, Marine recon. I looked at the, the, the various programs that the army was doing. Uh, I did not look at the air force cause I didn't, know about the, the pjs and, and whatnot back then uh and then kind of pretty quickly came to the conclusion that the, the seal teams looked like the right organization for me and so i enlisted the day after uh, i graduated from high school so i shipped out the day, day after uh graduation and yeah the next 20 20 years was a whirlwind so i went to I went to boot camp up in uh in chicago great lakes uh Many times during that, you know, two months of boot camp, I thought well, this might have been a horrible mistake joining the Navy because Navy boot camp. I think the most stressful thing in Navy boot camp is folding your clothes, uh, and then they yell at you while you're folding your clothes. But it, it was not. Like I was doing PT on my own time after lights out because I didn't want to get too too far out of shape. Uh, so. Went to graduate from that, went to Corman A School out in San Diego. And Corman is kind of the Navy speak for a medic. You know, the, the Navy doesn't have medics, they have Corman. The Marine Corps doesn't have medics, they have Navy Corman that go and support. And then, so I had wanted to be, well, I didn't really care about being a Corman, um, but it was a better alternative. It was basically, it was my backup plan. Because uh, if you just, you know, going into it with kind of with both eyes open and recognizing that. Uh, very few guys actually make it through the training. Uh, I did not want to be stuck on a ship someplace. And at least if I was a corpsman, I would have a chance to either go at, with uh, Marine Recon or with even just an infantry, you know, grunts would have been better than than being on a ship, at least in, in my opinion. Right. Um, so went to corpsman A school and then got orders to BUDS out of there. So BUDS is basic underwater demolition slash SEAL training. Uh, so I, I checked into Buds on Thanksgiving Day of uh, of '94 and was immediately told, "What what are you doing here? Get get out of here. We'll see you on Monday." Uh, and yeah, so thus thus began my uh, you know my my time in in the teams or going through selection first and then um, time in the team. So I had not that much trouble in Buds up until and and through Hell Week. So. Uh, you know, Hell Week is the uh, was the sixth or the eighth week, something like that. They they've changed it sometimes throughout the years, uh, and it's basically a week of you, you know you stay up on you know continuously. Basically, you get you get a couple little naps here and there. Uh, so pre Hell Week, I didn't have any any problems with with any of my running or you know timed runs or anything like that. Post Hell Week, I couldn't run an eleven minute pace to save my life very shameful uh i don't know what the deal was to this day like i've had guys say oh were you anemic or this or that yeah i've, I've had a lot of um things thrown at me as to oh it might have been this but the bottom line was i didn't know what what was wrong with me but all i knew was i could not run uh so going into dive phase that made it very painful because the, the first phase guys knew that okay there's something something is wrong with this guy uh the, the Going into second phase, they were like, who is this guy that is, you know, barely jogging on his on his conditioning runs and timed runs? Um, so that caused some problems for me. And then I actually I ended up failing the so I got rolled 
uh, going through dive phase. Uh, the, and the first time I got rolled was for dive physics. And this is somewhat embarrassing because I could do the physics side of dive physics, but I had forgotten how to do long division. So I, uh, so me and about eight other guys that failed, uh, they put us in a remedial math course where the lady really, she literally started with, all right, guys, this is how you add. That's so great. So yeah, it was, it was embarrassing. I didn't think it was great at the time, but I did learn how to do long division and I aced, the, I aced my test the, the next time through, but I still hadn't figured out the running piece yet. So I did, uh, the second time I got rolled was a lot worse for me because uh, I, I remember being in front of the basic training officer and he goes, you know, rapier, we've got, you, you, you know, you have two, two options and they're both bad. And uh, he goes, option number one, you can go clean bedpans at Balboa, which is where basically if you, if, as a corpsman, if you failed out, they were going to send you to the hospital there, the Naval Hospital in San Diego. Yeah. And uh, he goes, or you can, you can put a white t-shirt on and go join the, the first phase class. Wow. Uh, so I was, I was, like, oh, was, was going to be my next question. How far back did they roll you? Yeah. So I said, well, I'll take first phase, sir. <laughs> so wow. Ran down to... Uh, Ran to supply, got a white t-shirt because I'd thrown all, out all my white t-shirt. That's kind of a big deal is, is you wear a white t-shirt until you graduate hell week and then you get to wear a brown t-shirt. Uh, yeah, so ran, ran down there and got that. So I went from, I was supposed to do day one of Drager dive, so closed circuit diving. Uh, and then I went to, I think we did life saving that afternoon. <laughs> so, right. so, but the, the good thing was it actually, the pace of the runs was, was slow enough to where I was able to build back up. And so I was one of the, uh, not stronger, but probably in the top third by the time, you know, by the time I graduated buds. So it was, it was good for me. I was glad I got that opportunity to, um, you know, to continue on. So graduated buds. And then because I was a corpsman, I had to stick around, uh, went to, uh, dive, medic school. So basically just learning about the physiology of diving and, and medicine and, you know, how to treat people with dive related injuries, did that for a couple of weeks and then drove across the country, went to army airborne school, you know, basic jump school, and then went out to Fort Sam Houston for the short course, 18 Delta class or the special operations medics class. Uh, so I was the last class out there. Uh, intense, you know, very lots and lot, you know, typical military stuff They they, they cram uh, an incredible amount of medicine into a very short period of time, you know, about half a year. So went to that and then went right out, checked into SEAL Team 3. Uh, I had been told, so this was funny because I had been told oh, that they just started an STT class, like the SEAL tactical training class. Like there's, you know, there's no need to hurry out there, but I didn't have a life. So like, well, I might as well go check in to, you know, my new SEAL team. Uh, so I drove out, checked in and speaking with the, you know, the leadership there, they're like, oh, an STT class just started, you know, you're two weeks behind, but all we've covered so far is medical stuff. So you're, you're up to speed on all that. So I got to, I got to jump right in, which put me about a year ahead of, of my peer group, you know, coming out 18 Delta. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was nice. And then just, you know, very quickly got into a platoon, did a workup, about a year long workup deployed to the Middle East. This is all pre-war. This is mid mid nineties, mid to late nineties stuff here. Uh, did a deployment over there, came back. They said, Hey, we need a guy to, to jump right into another platoon and deploy. So in my mind, that was, I'm going to be home for a few days and then go back overseas, which, you know, that was no war. It was like, that was the only, you know, a little bit of a chance of getting to do something for real. So I, I rogered up and said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And then come to find out it was actually, they needed a guy to leave for the beginning of a workout out in the desert, <laughs> you know, um, like a couple of days after we got back. So, but it, it was all good. You know, I, I really didn't have a life back then. So I uh, jumped in right into another platoon. Uh, during that platoon, I screened uh, to go out to dev group and screened positive and went and deployed again, again to the Middle East, on, you know, on a, on a boat as part of a amphibious readiness group, the ARG or the MU. Uh, did not enjoy my time on a ship. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, came, came back. And I think within a few months of, of coming back, I was, uh, I, I went out to, thank you. I went out to, sorry, coffee delivery. Yeah, good. Within a few months, 
went out to uh, out to the East Coast and uh, went through selection and uh, six or eight months later, uh, you got you got through that. And that was that was good. Just, a good just challenge. For, just so people understand, what was your everybody? Most people are familiar with uh, buds. Obviously, it's got a lot of press over the years and everything. What was your to give people like an idea of what is the level up that you do when you do something like selection from something like you know buds you know you know getting through a, a buds training like was it uh, what's the what's the failure rate would you say I, and, I mean don't give away anything you can't but I mean is it is it similar how how is it it's a pretty high it's not quite as bad as as not quite as high of an attrition rate as buds uh, but it is pretty. Uh, it's still a fairly high attrition rate. And basically it's just, it's another SEAL team. Uh, and you have to be an experienced, you know, you have to have completed at least one or most guys have, have done two deployments before going there. And then it's peer reviewed, which is really one of the best ways to ensure that you're getting quality guys is by you know reaching out to people that knew him and actually worked with him both, you know, in positions above and below and just asking, Hey, who is this guy? So there's a lot of peer review that's involved. You have to have a good reputation. You have to be in shape. You have to shoot hard, all those things just to get there, you know, and then, and then they wash out a fair amount of guys uh, just going, going through it. So it's a pretty, uh, yeah, it's a good, it's a good organization to get into. Uh, so, yeah, so I went through, went through that and then you know got got into the, the squadrons and uh yeah the next 14 years was was kind of a blur it was a you know privilege to to be there and and work with uh you know some of the most capable men on on the planet and do yeah, some cool during, stuff also during one of the most active times uh yes, that the unit, for, that the unit sure. had um we talk about uh yeah you know, just to, to put it in perspective when i checked into seal team three the guys that were about year wise, they would have been about where I was when I retired. So senior chief, like 20 ish year guys, right. uh, they'd never done anything for real. Yeah. Cause they, they came in right after Vietnam and, you know, there was only a few little, you know, Grenada, Haiti, there's a few little desert storm teams didn't really do a whole lot. So there wasn't really a whole lot that, 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 that the guys had done, unless you really found yourself right place at the right time. There was, there was a, the majority of the guys hadn't done anything for real. Yeah. And I was terrified that that would be me. Uh, and I used to think, man, if I just get to do one real mission, like I can go, like I can retire and then, you know, just <laughs> like, you know, talk about it, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and, you know, and then, so from, from, from that to, you know, part way into our first Iraq, you know, during the initial invasion of Iraq, it was like, you know, we were doing multiple, multiple hits in a day. And if it had been like, if it had been a full day or, or, or slightly longer before we, had, you know, since we'd done anything, we're like, man, this is so lame. Like we're not doing anything. It's like actually 12 hours ago, we we're doing something. So uh, just, it's interesting how your perspective changes as, as you get to do more work. Yeah. I mean, it's just, the pace was just incredible for you guys. Um, during that time, uh, you, uh, you probably, you know, obviously we're, we're training you know, in, in instructing also, you know, like, like probably uh, within, um, I had heard that, that, you know, you guys have a lot of people that embed with you that aren't necessarily tier one operators in the, in the real sense, but you had, you were one of the people that would train somebody to be able to embed with you guys and not you know, they had to earn their right to be able to do it. They had to have some basic training and stuff. What was that like to deal with, you know, you've basically got the Jedis and then you're bringing in people who have core competencies that you guys need, but you've got to get them up to a certain level to be able to at least embed with you guys. So I, I didn't get to really do that until the, the very end of my career. Um, and specifically, I worked as part of our canine program. Uh, the last year and a half, two years or so that I was active duty. And so during that time frame, I had a bunch of guys that were Navy master at arms uh, that were working for, that were dog handlers that, right. that were working for me. And they had uh, less experience on the tactical and the shooting side of things. Uh, and so I just started grabbing these guys, at least on a weekly basis and saying, Hey guys, we're going to go shoot. 
And then we'd be on the road and say, we're going to shoot every day and we're going to, we're going to go out and, you know, train CQB every day. And then we're also going to do dog stuff. And that's kind of what, what led into me doing what I'm doing now, because, uh, the guys really liked it. And, you know, every once in a while we'd, we'd get to throw a, you know, a local law enforcement guy in on the line with us. That was just, you know, we'd get hosted by different, different agencies and stuff. So I'd, throw one of their guys in on, on the line and they would, they would come back and they go, man, that was, that was really good. Like you actually talked and demoed and didn't yell at us. And, uh, and I was just kind of shaking my head, like, doesn't everyone teach this way? And they'd say, no, like our, our range officers, normally they read a script and they yell at us and they, they never like shoot in front of students or anything like that. And so I kind of got encouraged. I had a bunch of retired cops that worked for me, uh, that were long time, you know, 20 or 30 year canine guys. And they really encouraged me and just said, Hey, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're good at doing this and you could, uh, you know, you could, you could make a living doing this and I enjoy doing it. Uh, and so, yeah. It, so I, when I retired that, that was the plan was to start teaching. Uh, I called one of my good friends, Kyle DeFore a couple of months before. And I said, Hey, Hey buddy, uh, you've been doing this for a while now, like any, any words of advice. And so he, he gave me some advice and, and then a few months into being a civilian, uh, he brought me out and I AI for him. So assistant instructed for him. And that was super helpful. Just kind of getting the, you know, my feet underneath me as far as, Hey, this is kind of how this is how a class should be run when you're, when you're teaching civilians, because, you know, because so, so much of the stuff that I had done was all, it was, we would bring in a specialist to, to, to teach us one component of it. But for civilians, you need more than one component of it. Like, it's not just about, okay, you know, we're, we're going to, you're, you're going to learn how to shoot well. Well, yeah, you have to learn how to shoot well if you're, if you're going to shooting class, but as a civilian, there's a lot of, you know, Hey, this is the whole, you know, you're, you're paying for this holster. You're paying for this pistol. Let's make sure you get the right stuff because if you get the wrong stuff, uh, it's, it's going to cause you significant problems. Whereas with, with mill guys, like there's not, you have, you have the, to a large extent, you have the tools that you have and you're not going to go out and just get a different holster or, you know, a different pistol or whatever. I mean, you, you can, but it's just, it's a more involved process. So it's just, teaching civilians uh there's just more to it uh and it's kind of so i i really didn't know as as i was retiring what i was you know kind of what i was getting myself into or what the general uh who i would be teaching the most you know would it be you know mill guys or cops or civilians and so i've kind of fallen into this or been blessed with i teach the, the majority of my students are civilians i get maybe maybe 20 to 30 percent are, are cops uh and then a few mill guys and i i really enjoy it because because the guys are they're super eager to learn they're not you know no one is showing up for my classes wearing multicam and uh you know <laughs> i mean i i mean every the only class that i teach with with exposed tools would be if i'm teaching an le class where where the majority of the guys are running duty belts in, in which case I'm going to teach to something that, that's going to be close, you know, closest to what they're using. Or when I do my night vision class, which I figure if you're, if you're putting body armor and a helmet on and carrying a rifle, like you're not fooling anyone, you might as well, yeah. you might as well wear an exposed holster for that. Right. Uh, you know, so overwhelmingly, every, you know, guys, guys show up, they know this about the classes now. So everything is shot from concealment. Everything is, is, Hey, is this a, a pistol that you actually will carry? you know, don't, don't show up and shoot a class with a, with a, you know, your, your race gun that you only break out for classes, you know, and then, and then you put your, you know, your little micro pistol back in your front pocket when you leave the range. Like I, I'm trying to build guys that aren't going to do that. I want guys that will, you know, train with the tools that they are most capable with uh, so, and then so, carry those tools. And hey, let's, let's open up that a little bit because that's really, you know, you and Kyle are the two guys everybody talks about, you know, obviously all the time. And, um, you're very similar in, in, in approaches, but what, what did you notice when you started going out with civilians and stuff? What do you think the biggest issue is? Because the idea is unless somebody's going to, you know, train for three gun or something like that and they, or a shooting sport, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But if they're training truly for self-protection, 
how they would actually use the gun to protect themselves, protect their family. You know, you do a lot of things that are very, you know, different, you know, meaning you, you, you emphasize movement and stuff like that. But what have, if you could speak to two things, one, when you got out and you saw how most people were training and you know, how, how they approach the subject, what do you want to make sure that your clients get out of the experience with you and how they're actually going to use, um, you know, a, a weapon to protect themselves? So I guess, I guess we'd have to go into priorities first. Yeah. So first and foremost, it, it's going to be awareness. Like before there's any, any amazing shooting ability, right? Jerry Barnhart level of, of running your blaster, you know, b b before any of that stuff matters, awareness, number one thing that keeps us alive. So that it is, it's the very first thing I talk about. I, I teach to like loading procedures with, you know, in terms of awareness, I actually call it circle awareness. So it's, it's a, it's a continuous thing that you're doing. So awareness, number one thing that keeps us alive. Um, then the next one would be hundred percent safety with your firearms. So as a civilian, the odds of you using your firearm to protect yourself and your family are super low. But if you're a gun guy, if you're like, Hey, this is, I carry a gun every day. That means you're handling your firearms at least twice a day at the, be at the beginning of the day when you get up. And in the evening when you go to bed. So if you are unsafe in your firearms handling while you're loading your weapons in the morning or downloading in the evening, if you're unsafe with it, uh, you're actually putting your family at more risk and you'd actually be better off statistically just not running, you know, leave your gun in your safe. Um, if, if you can't be 100% safe. Now, I think it's, it's not hard to be 100% safe with your tools and you, know, you just... We, you know, we have the four fundamental rules of firearm safety and they're all layered and they're all, uh, you know, th there's a reason for them all. Uh, so hundred percent safety with, with our tools, it would be the next one. And the next one would be, you know, that's that circle of awareness that being hundred percent certain that when you pull your pistol out, it's going to go bang and not click. Right. And people, you know, if you're, if you're not as into training, you might be going, well, yeah, like that seems like day one stuff. Well, it, it is day one stuff. And it also gets missed all the time by professionals. You know, I've, I've seen many, many guys that are professionals that, that, that get paid to carry a gun. You say, you know, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Beep or threat or go or whatever and click. Oh, shoot. Uh, so then the next one would be, so we've got, Aware, you know, heightened awareness, 100% safety with our tools, then 100% when you deploy your pistol, it's going to go bang. So that's that circle of awareness, making sure that your tools are, are on you and that they're configured properly. And then the next, the next most important thing would be clean draw stroke from concealment, being able to get your pistol out. Um, and it's not even so much being able to get it out in sub second. I mean, if you look at so many of the instances of violence, it's, man, if only the guy would have just not had his head in his phone, buried in his phone, he would have survived. Or if only the guy would have had a five second draw stroke, he would have survived. You know, it's not, you know, so just having a clean draw stroke from concealment. And then the next would be, and, and the next two, I, I kind of rate equally. Um, other strong hand only blade deployment and targeting and combative weapons retention shooting. And so we'll, we'll talk to the, the other strong hand only deployment and targeting first. So other strong hand is a term that comes from SIOC. Uh, that's one of the things across training. I think everyone should be doing this. Why, why are we as an industry saying strong hand and weak hand? Right. I mean, it's like, you don't say that in wrestling. I'm going to go train my weak side now. Like I'm going to go do arm bars on my weak side. <laughs> you know, it's no, I have a strong side. I have an other strong side. Uh, so the, the concept is being able to deploy a lethal tool with either hand. If once you can do that, you are an order of magnitude harder to deal with because now you know it's easy for, especially as a grappler, to, to you know two on one, you know to be able to control with with two of my hands to be able to control one of your hands or with one of my hands control one of your hands and with my other hand deploy a weapon or you know smash to the face or you know any of those things. Uh, as soon as the person is capable of deploying a lethal tool with either hand, now all of a sudden you have to track on both hands and it makes it way, way harder to deal with. And that's where we get into, you know, underhooks and, you know, seatbelt grips and stuff like that, different control positions that by the nature of the position uh, end up trapping or, or blocking one of the arms or shielding, you know, one of his sides to make it harder for him to draw. Uh, 
it is also probably the best weapons retention tool that you have. But you know, once once we get past awareness and just you know being heads up, if someone is going for a gun, being able to put your hand on the gun to keep it in its holster, that only gets you so long. But being able to you know, put put your hand on your gun to 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 slow him down for a short period of time and you know, I mean, it, it's not hard for us to get guys to do 0.4 seconds blade deployments. And we do, we do it on a shot timer from concealment. It's, it's not a hard thing to do. The fast guys are in the 0.3s or faster. Um, generally, like 0.5 or 0.6 on, on day one of, of guys repping it, we can do that. So that's significantly faster than I can pull a pistol out from concealment. Uh, so to be able to, all you need to do is buy yourself that half to three quarters of a second of, of time when, when the guy is going for your firearm and then you put a blade in his throat and you know, that, that's a huge, and especially for, you know, when we get into size strength, you know, age discrepancies, uh, when, when people are being assaulted, uh, you know, wrestling and jujitsu are great, but there's, there's a point where it doesn't matter how great you are at, at, you know, at grappling and punching and, you know, being able to move your body. Uh, if the other guy has hundred plus pounds of, of, of strength on you, uh, you need tools to be able to beat that. And so having that blade other strong side is a huge, uh, huge force multiplier. And then concurrently with that in order of importance would be that combative weapons retention shooting. And, so the way I teach it as a baseline is off a of spear elbow. So just elbowing someone in the face while you're pulling your pistol out. But it could also be cross-body checking. It could be grabbing a collar tie, you know, wrestler's tie, you know, on them while you're doing that. And you're basically, you're shooting at a, at a pretty steep downward angle through their pelvic girdle um, while, while you're doing that. Uh, being able to draw and shoot in the middle of, throwing punches and or in the middle of swimming for underhooks, right? For any of your grappling stuff, uh, you know, in, within that stand-up grappling range. Uh, those, so those things, aware, heightened awareness, 100% safety with your tools, circle awareness, i.e. your gun's going to go bang when you want it to. And then clean draw stroke from concealment. And then the, the, the last two are that other strong hand only blade deployment and targeting. And combative weapons retention shooting. That would be the, that's the stuff that I place the most emphasis on because I think that is more likely to save people's lives uh, than anything else. Now it doesn't excuse not being able to shoot at distance. You know, you need to be able to do accuracy work. Uh, but I think those other things are more, in, you know, when we talk about what, what's a normal engagement distance for, for a civilian or, you know, or for a cop for that matter, uh, how do they start that, you know, that would be another one. Like, how do you see yourself starting? If you see, you know, and, and how do you see, do you think it's going to be a, a random criminal that, that is working by himself that you I see and identify from outside of stand-up grappling range, and then you're able to deal with them. If, if you think that, then, you know, you, your system might look a little bit differently than mine. I kind of tend to think, well, what's, what's worst case is it's, it's a crew of criminals working together. And like, I was having a bad day and was not paying attention. And it started with me being punched in the face. And, and, and what is your, you know, what's your draw stroke look like from there? What is your, your, your immediate action drill look like from there? Uh, and so that's really the, you know, the, the shoot five or six different pistol classes that we have now, they all have some element of combatives in them. Almost all of them have blade use in it. Uh, and that's, you know, it's probably what I'm most passionate about teaching is the pistol combative side of things is, you know, the, the pistol is the, the, the fastest force multiplier, right? We can take someone, you can take a 75 year old, you know, grandma right. and, and you give her a two hour lesson with a pistol and, you know, she could be a problem. You know, she's yeah. sitting on her couch and you're breaking down her door, as long as she's got time to pull that blaster out, you know, she, she yeah. could be a problem. Whereas it doesn't matter how much jiu-jitsu or wrestling we teach her, right. like it's, she's not going to be a problem if, if that's all that, 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 she, get, that, that she has. Um, blade, 
it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, she's going to have to be a little bit sneakier with it, right? Because it's, it's more up close. Um, but still, if you don't realize that she has this, to, if, 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 if you, you know, she's got her hand in her purse and, and the bad guy comes up and thinks he can have his way with her, that's, you know, if, if she knows where to put the blade and what to do post penetration, like it's not going to end well for this guy. Yeah. Uh, and then la- so that's why I, I teach, you know, firearm, firearm centric blade centric and then empty hand or you know fi- you know fixed weapons or any of the impact weapons any of the other weapons after that but it's all it's all like what i love about it is all a seamless transition meaning you know you, you i was talking to some other guys i've trained with you uh talk to you uh frank you know frank wendell uh, yeah. before he passed and he he complimented he loved that you know he talked about that whole idea of transitioning you know being able to smoothly transition into the tools that you need um, what is that's your, huge. I yeah, mean, just it, the, just, just to speak to that for, for, for one second, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you yeah. off. Um, the, it really is the transitions, right? Because there are guys that are great boxers and, and maybe they can also shoot a pistol well, and maybe they can also do ground stuff and maybe they can do blade stuff. But if you don't know how to do them all concurrently, i.e. what's your draw stroke look like after your right cross, what does your draw stroke look like? after swimming under hooks you know after throwing that elbow and that's where the transition is and then how do you use it together like does your if you're doing something with a blade in your hand does that you know can you no longer do anything with a firearm or if you if you're doing blade stuff now can you only use the hand that has a blade in it or are you still able to punch people and elbow people in the face if your blade gets tied up um, so all these things is it really is the the transition is the the finer point or the more important point of it. Okay, that's a great place for us to stop um, right now with Bill. Uh, you know, interesting, interesting background on how he became uh, interested in being in the teams and development, and then um, what his experience was when he was in. Uh, you can see it's not all a straightforward path; requires a lot of tenacity. Uh, but I think it's really interesting, you know, to hear somebody's background and how they, how they got to where they're at. We ended up at a perfect point, um, to end it and then get into part two on the next one. Uh, again, support bill, go to Amtac training. Uh, all the links are in the, are in the show notes, uh, for his IG accounts. And, uh, you know, if you, it's one of the rare chances you have to, to train with a subject matter expert that is literally giving you the best information. He wants you to get it. And also he's going to train you in methods that you probably wouldn't be able to do in many other training environments, meaning he's going to train you to use the tool the way you'd actually need it. Should you have to protect yourself? Very unique training that way. We talk more about that in the upcoming uh, parts two and three. But until then, if you are ready to make your own self-protection strategy for you and your family, go to timlarkin.com, give us your email, and we will start you off on your path to creating that strategy for you and your family. Also, please subscribe to this channel, support this channel, make comments, hit the notification bell, and most importantly, share it with your friends. That is how we are growing, and I truly appreciate that. So until next time, stay safe.